If you have your Bibles, turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 7. We'll be looking at these three verses that our brother read earlier, asking God to open our hearts to his truth. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23 is the text that we're in this morning. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Do mighty miracles or mighty works in your name? Then verse 23, Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Let's pray. Oh, great God of heaven, this passage is a heavy passage for us all. And Lord, as we have sung, my heart wants to say you are worthy. I adore you. You are my everything. But yet I often look at my own heart and see I can easily be deceived because there are times that you are not my everything. And I think that goes for all of us. And so, Lord, we need your gracious hand to evaluate our hearts, your gracious spirit to open up our eyes that we might see the truth of this text. And we might not be deceived any longer. Oh, Lord, help us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had some bad news that shook you to the foundation of your core? <laughs> I have, whether it be a sickness, whether it be a tragedy, whether it be some difficulty, and it just shook me, brought me to anxiety and fear and worry. I'm not prone to that necessarily, but certainly those kinds of times come in all of our lives. Well, to be honest with you, Jesus is taking this to another level when we read this passage. It's shocking. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then he adds this comment in verse 23. That is shocking. It should awaken all of us, should it not? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. That's a word I never want to hear from my Savior. But it's there. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. If we were to be honest with one another this morning, this is a horrifying truth. There will be some who come to the gates of heaven. They confess that they knew Christ. They say to him, Lord, Lord, which is it really a, a statement of the fact that I believe you are God, deity, Lord, Lord. But yet their confession is fake. It's not real. It's not true. Oh, they think they're sincere, by the way. That's even the more horrifying part about it. They think they're real. They think they've had a real confession. They've had a real belief. But this passage tells us that they're self-deceived. Let me ask you this morning as we begin in this passage. If you were to ask someone close to you to evaluate your walk with Jesus, your relationship with him, what would you say? What would they say? If you were to take a spiritual inventory test this morning, how would you grade yourself? Better yet, what if our wonderful Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the only one worthy to really grade us, if he were to hand you a report card this morning, what would you get? Would you get a statement that said, well done, my good and faithful servant? <laughs> or would you hear these words, depart from me? I never knew you. This is the seriousness of this passage, and it's weighty. It's an important question, a significant question that we must ask, and quite frank, it's a question that a lot of us want to avoid. But this is a verse we must consider, for the Lord Jesus calls it to our attention. He wants all of us to evaluate our spiritual condition. And let's be honest with ourselves and honest with God this morning as he helps us through this. Now for the big picture. We're coming to the end of Jesus' first sermon series, which started in Matthew chapter 5, 
and goes through chapter 7. He's laying out for us what it means to follow him. He doesn't go light on these things, does he? He doesn't make it easy for his listeners, but he tries to get to the very heart of the matter. Because the heart of the matter is always not our outward actions, it's our inner heart. It's the inward part of man that Jesus is always concerned about. Quite frankly, in our flesh, in our natural state, if we were to grade ourselves, what would we get? An F. None of us deserve anything other than that in our natural state. But here are these words that none of us wants to hear. Although we might act like we're religious, even those Jesus said there's some here who say they're followers of him, but here's what he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, workers of lawlessness. This is a sad and seemingly helpless declaration spoken by our Lord. As we look at it in the, his first sermon series, what if he looked at us and said, get away, leave. I don't have a place for you in my heaven. There's no room at the table for you. I don't know who you are. Those are harsh words. Lord, please don't let that be any of us sitting in this room. But I fear it could easily be any of us, could it not? These words are difficult. But we cannot read Jesus' first sermon and not think that he had a lot of people gathered around him and he was dividing here. He was speaking the truth. The truth often divides, does it not? But there's also hope here. There's hope for our self-deceiving hearts. It's words like the Father. I compare these, this particular passage, to words like a father who's taking, on his, taking his boys on a camping trip, especially when they're young. And they're walking around, and all of a sudden, the little boy looks like there's a big black stick there, but it's yet moving a little bit. And he wants to, you know, he's, he's curious. He wants to reach it, reach down and pick it up. And the father says, no! If you pick that up, it might bite you. Or a little bit later at night, they build a fire, and they walk over to the fire, and he wants to reach down and pick up one of those glowing things. They look good, don't they? And he reaches down to pick it up, and the father says, no! He screams. This is a scream for us tonight, today, I should say. Jesus is screaming. He's making an alarm, right? Don't go play in the street, the father might say. Are those harsh, angry words? No. They're the most loving, kind thing that a father could do. He's warning them. He's calling out to them. You've done that. Calling out to your family. Calling out to your children. This is dangerous. Don't go there. That's the way I understand this passage. Because, many reasons, but remind, let me remind you in chapter 5, verse 20, he tells his listeners through this series, For I tell you, unless your righteousness... Is, exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. You will not enter into the kingdom of God. He's making a distinction here about righteousness. Now, upon careful examination of the words that Jesus speaks here, there is hope. His diagnosis is there to shake us up, to wake us up, to, so that we will identify the self-deception that so easily comes into our own lives and our own heart. Jesus holds out hope, and what is that hope? That hope is in knowing and doing the will of God. The second part of verse 21. But the truth is, before we can even get there, we must face the self-deceiving part. And so who is Jesus referring to here? May I quickly unpack verses 21 and 22. Two statements about that that I want to make. They explain to us who the self-deceiving people are. First, the self-deceiving are those who have made a public profession of faith, but their hearts have never been changed. This is what he says in verse 1. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, these people have spoken about Jesus. They've said he's my Lord, Lord, but their lives have never re reflected it. They've never been changed. This is a statement. It's a beautiful statement. But put it in the context... It condemns because he's saying that these people do not belong to me. They've made a false, they have a false assurance made on a false confession that led to a false kind of faith. 
We're not to believe in our own belief. We're not to believe in our own faith. We're not even to believe in our own repentance. We're to believe in Jesus. Christ and Him alone is our only hope. Let's be assured that true faith leads to new life and a spiritual fruit. But in contrast, a public profession or faith that does not result in new life and a changed life is a great self-deception. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells the parable. You remember the parable of the sower? He said, the truth is the word went out. And it went out to different places. Some of that seed fell on the path, and what happened? It was trampled on. Some of the seed fell on the rocky ground, and the birds came and ate it up. Some of that seed fell on uh, uh, the thorns, and they were choked out. And some of the seed fell on the good soil. The good soil was the only one that led to fruit and life. You see, when the truth of the word falls on the good soil, it changes the heart, it changes the life, it produces something different. We also read in John chapter 2, a few weeks back, and uh, Pastor Keith preached on it, there were those who said they followed Jesus. And this is a haunting passage too. He, it says there they believed in Jesus. They had faith in Jesus, but Jesus didn't believe in them. He didn't have faith in them. He didn't entrust himself to them. And then it clarifies why. Because he understood the heart. He knew the heart of man. And so you can't read the Beatitudes and not dig carefully into it to see that Jesus is, is, is showing us the heart again. You see, there is a great deception that we can speak the words but not have a changed life. But there's a greater danger. Can there be? Yes, look at the next section. There's a deception of our own words, but there's also a deception of actions. These self-deceivers are ones who have taught are ministered in a public way, but have never experienced saving faith. Verse 22 spells this out. They not only confess with their mouth, but their actions look like faith. This is even a greater deception, is it not? Jesus uses three phrases here. Each one of the statements have, have actions behind it. And of course, notice what the actions, according to those who confess, Said They said, we did, or did we not? So it starts again with, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Or did we not cast out demons in your name? Or did we not do many mighty works in your name? Although the did we not is not repeated, it's understood here in, the, in this context. That all three of the statements were, Lord, Lord, did we not? Lord, Lord, did we not do these things? Jesus, we taught about you. We led Bible studies. We even preached. We led a small group. We exposed the scriptures to people. And Jesus will look at them and say, I never knew you. Or Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Don't you remember? You taught us to pray. <laughs> Matter of fact, you told us if we were to pray, that was a way this, way this demon, I don't know if they were praying or not, but could it be that they prayed? Or could it be that they use the name of Jesus to provoke a demon to come out of someone? But yet at the same time, he says, I never knew you. Or could it be that you did many mighty works in Jesus' name? In other words, you worked hard for Jesus. And they say, Jesus, didn't you see me work hard for you? And what were his response? What was his response? Well, it's not what you do for me. He said, I don't know you, and you don't know me. Now, these words, or even these actions, may look good from those people on the outside, but Jesus sees the heart. He knows what's going on on the inside. He knows what's in a man. Jesus is pressing those who are listening to him teach, and he's pressing us this morning to evaluate. Evaluate your words. Evaluate your actions. Evaluate your heart. Do you believe in him alone? He's not wanting his hearers to just play judge and point fingers at others, by the way. That's not what he wants. He's not wanting us to search others' hearts. We can't do that anyway. 
But we have a tendency to do that, don't we? No, he's saying, I want you to search your own heart. So he's not interested in you or I looking with critical spirit or, or suspicious eyes toward others. He's asking us to look at ourselves this morning. He's warning us of what could happen to each of us if we're not careful. So what is the answer to this self-deception? Who are those that are deceived? And who are those that are not deceived? Well, we looked at who are those who are, who are deceived. Jesus gives us a hint here in verse 21 of those who are not deceived. When he says, they are the ones, the ones who do the will of the Father in heaven. And so let me carefully, quickly point this out. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 of Jesus' sermon says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs are the kingdom of heaven. He starts right there. What is poor in spirit? It means that I have come to understand and I come, I've come to see my great need for God. Amen. I am a helpless. I am dependent completely and totally on Jesus. I am powerless to change my spiritual condition. There's nothing I can do or act or, or, or say that's going to change that. My only hope is that I fall at the knees of Jesus and say, Lord, I need you. You're my only hope. That is the kind of heart God desires. One is broken in spirit. He, conti he continues that all throughout the sermon. But let me remind you again in chapter 6 how he put it. He said, beware of the righteousness of the Pharisees. He says those, those Pharisees try to do this righteousness even when they give, even when they pray, even when they fast. He says when they give, they shout trumpets. Look what I've given. Jesus said, don't do that. You give in such a way that your left hand and your right hand don't know what you're doing. He says, they pray on the street corner so everybody can see them. And Jesus said, no, go in your closet. Pray to your Father who's secret. Don't tell people what you're doing. And then he said the same thing about fasting. They just form their face and look gloomy and look like we're fasting. They draw attention to themselves. And Jesus said, don't do that. Wash your face. Do it secretly. Any public outward focus, brothers and sisters, is a means of self-justification that leads to self-deception. That's the problem. And it hits us as leaders just as well as it comes to you. Can I say that again? Any public focus as a means of self-justification leads to self-deception. Because it becomes all about me, not about my Jesus. And so how do we do the will of God? Well, there's a passage in John chapter 6 that I think is most clear. So I want to take you there as I conclude and wrap up these thoughts. Jesus makes it very plain in John 6, beginning in verse 38 through 40. But particularly verse 40, I hope this is helpful. I think this is one of the clearest parts here to help us see this. For he says, I have not come down from heaven. Is it up here? Okay. For I have not come down from heaven, or excuse me, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Verse 40. For this is the will of my Father. Catch it. This is the will of my Father. Here it is. Don't miss it. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on his Son and believes in him should have eternal life. Who is the one who does the will of the Father? The one who runs to Jesus. Those who run to Jesus and cry out to him, Lord, I am a sinner, I am helpless, I am in need of you. There is nothing I can do to make myself look good or right in your eyes. I have no righteousness of my own. I have no goodness of my own. My only hope is that you would forgive me. My only hope is that you would receive me. My only hope is your mercy and your grace. There is nothing that I can do, nor nothing that I will do, that will make me right in your sight. Those do not say, Lord, I did this for you. They say, I need Jesus to do this for me. He is my only hope. Those who do the will of Father acknowledge that Jesus is the truthful and the right one. He is the worthy one. He's worthy to rule over my life. He's worthy to rule over your life. And they confess and abhor their sin. They throw themselves on Jesus and they say, it's either Jesus or nothing. 
This passage teaches that if I ignore Jesus, if I run and hold on to my own wit, will, and wisdom, brother, and you say that often, I agree with you. If I hold to my wit, will, and wisdom, I'm doomed to eternal damnation, actually, even. Not just doomed in this life. No, if I reject Jesus, or if I do, the source of life, He will disown me. The sad fact is that Jesus says in this passage, I don't even want to say this, but it's true. There will be many who do this. Wow, that's, that's a strong statement. They will look to justify themselves by their works, by their actions, and by their lives, by their own abilities, and not faith in Him alone. It will not be our words. It will not be our position. It will not be our ministry that justifies ourselves in, in God's sight. Our only hope will be Jesus and the amazing grace that's offered at His cross. It's His blood that cleanses us from our sins. And so, this gift, by the way, comes through faith in Him. This is God's way. It is God's plan. It is the will of God that you run to Jesus. This passage tells us, right? Run to Jesus. Cast yourself on Him. Believe in Him alone. In any other way, one seeks heaven. It will only be from their own efforts, and it will fail them. They will seek to justify their own actions, their own attitudes, their own lifestyle by some self-effort. But it will result in self-deception and eternal damnation. You see, heaven is filled with those who look on the Son and believe in Him. That's the answer. Heaven is filled with those who look to Jesus and believe in Him. This is the will of the Father for you and for me. Believe in Him. Submit to Him. Run to Him. Confess your sins to Him. And say, Lord, I am nothing. I am in need of You. Jesus, You are my everything. So let's throw off all attempts to justify ourselves, our actions, and cast ourselves completely and wholly on Jesus. He is the one that is the Savior, and this is what God requires of all people. So why has God designed it this way? This is because Jesus is worthy. And God desires to glorify His Son in all things and glorify Himself. And when we come and throw ourselves on Jesus and we say, Jesus, You alone are the one, then we're glorifying Him. We're not saying it's me, it's not mine, it's not my will. I look to Jesus. He is my only hope. And so as I finish, where are you this morning? Can you be honest with God this morning, honest with yourself? Can you let Him evaluate your heart? And as He shouts to us this morning, can we listen to His voice and say, Yes, Lord, I'm leaning on You. Not my wit, will, and wisdom. I'm leaning on You. I'm coming to You. I'm believing in You. You are my only hope. Let's pray. Well, Father, this is not only true for our salvation, but this is true for our sanctification in our life. Once we come to know you, we recognize that our only hope to stay with you is you. And so, Lord, we pray this morning, we need you desperately. We need your kindness. We need your grace. We need your love. And any of us can be self-deceived. So I pray this morning that those who understand and see their own deception would repent, would confess it to you, would run to Jesus and ask for help. Oh, Lord, may they look to you and may we, your people, to you and may we your leaders lead people to look to Jesus in whose name we pray amen